Today is a very happy day. It's a very joyful day in the life of our church. Well, why? Multiple reasons. The first is that we're all gathered here for the chief privilege of the Christian life, to worship the Lord, to gather in his presence with those that we love. It's a wonderful thing. Tanner already mentioned that later on today, there's another reason we have to be thankful to the Lord, and that is that tonight we, we look forward to joining together again in anticipation of um, making our commitments to the work that God is doing in this church, in this building, in this area, giving of ourselves to the work of God for the continuance of his work to the next generation and the next generation, and that's our prayer to a thousand generations. We desire to be faithful. That is our desire, to be faithful as a church until Jesus returns. The third reason we have to be thankful, it just is obvious, is that it's the best holiday of the year this week, Thanksgiving. In some ways the most unadulterated of all the holidays and a real joy, especially to those of us as Christians who understand the depth of the rationale for why we are to be thankful. All that God has done in our lives. And yet, even on a morning that is filled with many reasons to be happy, uh, there are obvious, real trials. There are significant hardships, not just out in the world, but in this room, in our lives, as we look around, as we pray for the congregation together. There are real occasions of suffering and loss. There is sickness. There is death. There are deferred aspirations and attempts at things that you have fallen short of. There are true financial hardships. There's great blessing of God being given. And there are the trials of God which he takes, where he takes from us where he places something in our laps that is difficult or where he prunes us. What does God require from you in our own hours of joy and plenty as well as sorrow and loss? Because if you aren't a man or a woman today who is experiencing some of the unhappiness which I just mentioned, it is inevitable. It may not be today. But it may be tomorrow or it may be in five years. If you are unhappy today, there will be joy in the morning is what God says. So both these aspects of life come to both of us. So how do we live as Christian men and women in this world, not in heaven yet, in the midst of joy and sorrow? What does he require from us? What is it that God both desires from us and for us? Through the the course of our lives, where we invariably, where we inevitably will come across joy and sorrow. Bear that question in mind as we read from our passage. Would you stand with me, turn your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. It is just for you who are, who like to plan out things in advance. My plan is to go back to Acts next week. This morning and this evening, we'll be looking at the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 21. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality, rather, or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. For this, is, for this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but are now light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate 
in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things have become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason I say, awake, sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. The word of the Lord. Would you raise your hands and pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for what it teaches to us, and we pray now that our hearts would be ready to be taught, that our minds would be attentive, that our eyes would be undistracted, that our worries and fears would not just be held at bay, but that, would, that they would be blown away as we reflect on you and your character, your love, your protection, every blessing and mercy that comes down from heaven into our laps. And Father, may we be thankful in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The passage that we've just read together gives much instruction for how we as believers should live lives that model our Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul opens up this section of his writing at the beginning of chapter 5 with an exhortation to be imitators of God. And what does that mean? Well, he expounds upon that. To walk in love following the example of Jesus who is God. Jesus, who loved us to such a degree that he gave his life for us. And after this initial charge, he spends the rest of the chapter sort of fleshing out what this command means, and he does so in a few ways. You just read the chapter along with me. And in the beginning, he warns about what he calls the deeds of darkness. Immorality impurity, greed must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints, those that are Christians, those that claim to love Jesus. There must be no filthiness, silly talk, or coarse jesting, which is not fitting. Now, near the end of the section that we read, in verse 15, he picks up a very similar tone, and he says, therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise making the most of your time because the days are evil. Strikingly, he says something else in the chapter twice. And it grabbed me when I was reading through this earlier this week. He says twice in these verses that we are to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. In verse 10, he says it. And in verse 17, he says it again understand what the will of the Lord is. It's an interesting concept to think about, isn't it? How often do we seek to learn what is pleasing to the Lord? How often is that thought on your mind? We never have to learn how to please ourselves. That sort of knowledge is innate. But when you're speaking about another person... You must learn what they desire. You must learn what is pleasing to them. Perhaps you've gotten married. And you realize that there is a learning curve to understanding that other person's needs and wants, their desires. Perhaps it's taken you some time to figure out what they desire from you. Perhaps sometimes you've been frustrated by the fact that you can't seem to figure out what it is they desire from you. There's a, a great video that's humorous and it contains a lot of truth that was put out many years ago, the earlier years of the internet. Uh, have you ever heard the, the YouTube video that's titled something like, It's Not About the Nail? Is this resonating with any of you? No. Okay, well, 
Uh, I'm not going to show the clip, but there's a woman, and she has a tragic problem, an unexplainable problem, and she's sitting next to her husband on the sofa explaining the depth of turmoil she's in, the depth of emotional anguish that she's experiencing at this moment. If she could only figure out why she feels this way, why life is this way, why there's this anxiety, this pressure, this pressure, this pressure, and as the camera zooms out from the, the photo and you, you see more of both of them, she's sitting there next to her husband with a nail in her forehead, and the husband keeps going, well, uh, you know, as she's speaking, well, honey, 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 no, don't listen to me, listen, there's this pressure, and at the end of the video clip, yeah, he says, honey, there's a nail in your forehead. And she says, it's not about the nail. That's the video. It's a funny example of a man who's struggling with the very thing that I'm speaking to you about. He's trying to understand her, her, his wife has certain desires, certain emotions, certain feelings, and he's trying to understand them and to be helpful. He's really struggling. This can be true of women to men as well, but... With other people, it takes work to learn what they desire at times. This is the reality with, with, uh, with all relationships. We must seek to understand what others desire. The same is true with the Lord. Seek to understand what the will of the Lord is. Unlike human beings, though, God is consistent, and he's steady, and he's clear. He doesn't have any conflict of emotions or sinful inclinations that makes his desires sort of convoluted or murky or twisted together. Uh, he doesn't have uh, desires that shift and change over time. He is the same and he desires the same from us. He desires from us the same things that he desired from men and women gathering to worship him in the book of Acts uh, over a thousand years, uh, a couple thousand years ago. Thankfully, he has told us, most of all, what he does desire. Paul does not want there to be any confusion about how to please the Lord. In this chapter where he exhorts us to it twice, he tells us two times, very specifically, in our passage, very practical command that is the foundation of living a life that is pleasing to the Lord. Are you ready for it? Foundation to the life of pleasing the Lord. Here it is. He tells us, to be thankful. These two specific exhortations stand out in a chapter with a lot of general admonitions to not walking in darkness, but walking in the light, to not living in falsehood, but honoring the truth. These co commands to be thankful stand above the rest, being very specific, clear, practical, specific. Verse 4 and in verse 20. Be thankful, there must be no filthiness, silly talk, coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. Verse 20, always giving thanks for all things in the name of Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. What is pleasing to the Lord? What does he desire from you? Thankfulness. The Christian life is a life of thanksgiving. Those who are not grateful... Do not know the love or the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Those who are not thankful do not understand or know the love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. This might seem like an overstatement. But the Bible makes it very clear that those who are not thankful do not have the love of Jesus abiding in them. Those who are not thankful have rejected the truth. Those who are not thankful have hearts that are hard toward God. In Romans 1, Paul says this exact thing. He writes that God has made his presence known to all men. In other words, no one can look at the galaxies above our heads. No one can observe the coral reefs that lie many, many, many feet below the top of that chilly blue water and not have some recognition that this isn't just all cosmic chance. But rather, there is a God who has created these things for a purpose and who upholds these things by his power. But they have refused to acknowledge him as such. 
They have refused to honor him. They have refused to give thanks. And therefore, they have become futile in their speculations, and their hearts have become darkened. That's what it teaches us in Romans chapter 1. Those that refuse to give thanks to God are those who receive God's wrath. Those who do not honor him are those whose foolish hearts, as Romans says, have been darkened and who live in darkness rather than in light. So I go back to the statement that I made just a moment ago. Those that are not thankful to the Lord do not know the love of his son, Jesus Christ. If you are a Christian, then thankfulness is not some sort of hallmark sentiment that you choose to put up with or to put on, clothe yourself with like an ugly Christmas sweater in the holidays. Nor is it a response that you only choose to emit from your person on certain occasions. But it is to be the soundtrack of your life. It is the song that you sing in the morning. And it is the song in the evening when the sun has gone down and you lay your head down to rest. Our lives are to be testimonies of gratitude. Our lives are to be memorials of thanksgiving to God. I want to read again verse 20 of our passage, and this is going to be the the verse within the text that we focus on for the remainder of our time together this morning. Verse 20, he's just spoken about how we are to gather and sing and worship with each other psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Then he says, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. I'd like us to consider what we are instructed to in verse 20. First, what does it mean to give thanks? It means the emotion of gratitude, the expression of our gratitude, regardless of the form that that expression takes. Gratitude and the spirit of thanksgiving can and should be communicated in many ways. The most obvious expression of gratitude is what? Well, the most obvious form of expression that it ought to take is our words, our our mouths, our voices. And yet, we aren't talking all the time. We aren't singing all the time. The most obvious is through our speech, But this is not the totality of how our thanksgiving and our gratitude is shown. Sometimes, gratitude and thanks is shown with our tears, isn't it? Often, I was thinking about this, gratitude is seen in the eyes of a man or a woman. As parents, we understand gratitude in our children far before They are old enough to speak to us rationally, to form words in their mouths, and to communicate to us verbally. They communicate their gratitude to you, to me, as a mother, father, grandparent, through their eyes, through their smile, through their whole demeanor. Gratitude and thankfulness are always expressed through actions of obedience. What I'm pushing us towards here is to recognize that when we are told to give thanks always and for all things, it starts with a heart that is filled with gratitude. And we should express gratitude with our speech. I think I've spoken about that here before. The person who claims to be grateful but that does not speak it, because we probably know people who say I'm thankful, I'm happy, but it never comes out. People like that are like a pool filled with water on a hot, blistering summer day that the children can't swim in. That's what those people are like. But our mouths and our speech ought to be thankful, and that is a baseline. That's the baseline. But but gratitude toward God and thanksgiving toward him are shown all throughout our lives. Throughout all the avenues that our emotions and our actions can can come from our heart. Gratitude is an emotion, and yet all throughout the Bible, emotions are tied to our actions. 
So Jesus said, if you, if you love me, an affection of the heart, then you will keep my commandments, and you will act. When he's speaking to Peter, after Peter's denial and Jesus' resurrection, he says, do you love me? Then he says something similar, tend my sheep, care for my flocks. To go about a laborious task, every day, happily, or to handle some sort of frustration, cheerfully, is to thank God. To bear sickness and pain patiently, because it is according to his will, is to thank God. To mourn with those who mourn, because you love Jesus Christ and you desire to obey him, is to bless God. When we are obedient to God, that obedience is an outward expression of thankfulness to God. Again, this is not to speak against speaking our thanksgivings, but what I'm saying is, is that it's, it starts in the heart, and of course it comes through the mouth, but the mouth is not the only avenue. It is not the only pore from which our gratitude and praise should seep. Angels, when they praise God, not only sing hallelujah, but they obey the voice of his word, obeying his commandments. We must give thanks to God with every shape and expression that our hearts can, that is suitable to the occasion, at all times, in, in all ways, giving thanks to God. First, we have thought about what giving thanks consists of for a few moments, what we are to do. Now I want to consider when we are to do it. The real challenge of this verse is not that we are to give thanks to God. I mean, think about that challenge. Wow, life is, your life is hard. Giving thanks. But the challenge really isn't in the command to give thanks. The challenge comes from the two alls which are contained in that short little verse. All ways and for all things. It's, to give thanks sometimes is easy enough. When there is peace, when all is right in the world, or at least in our lives, on happy days... If we do not give thanks to God, then we are worse than unbelievers. Anyone would have a heart that is happy and thankful. When their home is a place of enjoyment, when their relationships are good, when they have money to spare, when you don't have any issues on your house, when you have a fridge and a freezer that are full, when your cars drive as they ought to, when politicians that you voted for make it into office, when you are appreciated and validated and seen at work, it, it's easy to be thankful. It's easy to be happy. It's easy to give thanks. No one needs to be urged to be thankful when the oil and the wine abound. But your duty as a Christian calls you to something further than that which is natural. What God calls you to is a life of giving thanks always and for all things. We are to give thanks to God always. He wants, to give, he wants us to give thanks always, and if that were not clear enough, he specifies by saying all things. Again, just tightening things down a little bit more. It seems reasonable to give thanks for things that are pleasant and enjoyable, but to give thanks for all things? That is much harder to swallow. We may think that Paul here is being a bit hyperbolic for good measure, speaking with hyperbole, so that he, you know, it's like when you put the bar further than what your kid wants, you want, what you want your kids to reach so that they don't fall too short, right? Like that's what he's doing. Okay, he's saying always, all the time, for everything, so the expectation is, you know, most of the time. No, that's not, that's not what he's doing. Paul is not being hyperbolic. He's not being a bit extra. He is not living some version of the victorious Christian life that goes from good to better to best. He says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sakes, and in my flesh I do share on behalf of Christ's body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Remember that, Christ, that Paul suffered many, many times and in many ways as he carried the gospel outward. 
The Apostle Paul was an example of rejoicing always, and he calls us to do the same. Not in some unrealistic sense where we delude ourselves about life and tell ourselves that everything is going to be great, that there's nothing hard on the road ahead. No. He just said a few verses earlier, if you recall, that we are to be thankful in days that are what? What did he say? How did he describe the time in the chapter? He said, evil. The days are evil. And then he said, give thanks always for all things. We are to give thanks to God always and for all things. When we are young, we are to give thanks to God for the joys of youth, for godly parents, for God's protection. When we are in the middle of our years, we are to thank God for the strength that he gives us to continue on, for the ability he's given us to provide, for the joys that we have in our families, for sanctification. And when we are older, we are to thank God for the fruit that he has allowed us to bear and for him allowing us to continue to be fruitful in life, even as we're unfruitful in many ways. We can't work. We can't have children anymore. There's many ways physically where the life is not fruitful necessarily in the older years, but with God it is. We should be thankful to him for that. We are to thank him for the wisdom that we've gained and the opportunity to share it with others. We are to thank him for the hope of heaven and the anticipated joys that we'll have there. We should thank God when our wealth increases. That's easy. This verse also means that we are to thank God when our wealth melts away. We are to thank God when we succeed, but we are also to thank him when we fail. We must thank him in times of health, and we must also thank him when we are sick. We are to thank him in seasons of growth, seasons of excitement, we are to thank him in seasons of pruning, seasons where we mourn. Was not Job a glorious example when he said, the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord, after he had torn his garments in anguish and shaved his head in despair? Was it not a glorious thing for Paul the one instructing us, and Silas, to sing praises when they were thrown into the inner recesses of a Roman dungeon for crimes that they had not committed. None of us can imagine actually how horrible it was to be thrown into a Roman's dungeon. How, sick, how full of sickness those cells were. How loud the wailing of other inmates that were locked up down the hall. How dank and musty the walls, how bloodstained the floors from the beatings and the whippings that ha happened all the time. And yet that was the environment. After being beaten and put into stocks, bleeding and likely laying on their backs because the angel calls them and says, get up, get up off the floor. Laying on their backs, having been whipped on that stone floor, that is the occasion and the circumstance, the environment in which Paul and Silas sang praise to God so loudly that the prisoners awoke and heard them. This is to thank God as we should, to bless him in the dead of night with bleeding backs and feet in the stocks. What a feeling it would be to feel that nothing in this life, nothing in death, should make us stop thanking the Lord, should cause us to cease from thanking the Lord. That ability is not natural. It is the result of God's love and his grace. That is not the ability that anyone who doesn't know Jesus has. We are to give thanks to God always and for all things. This includes the kindnesses of God which are obvious as well as those that we take for granted. His mercies that we see and those that we do not see. For every time that you notice something in life, and recognize that it's God's mercy or grace to you and keeping you from that thing that might have happened. There are many other instances that you do not recognize, that you do not see. There are many sweet, peaceful dreams in the night. There are many close calls and accidents that you should have or might have been in that God spared you from. There are many threats of danger that you do not recognize that are not seen on your security cameras. And God is showering you and I, me, 
with mercies. Many years ago, there was a man who met his son. Each of them was traveling a long way on horseback to meet each other at a middle point. When they met, the son said to his father, I want to speak to you and tell you about something that happened on the way. There was a remarkable providence of God, a remarkable mercy of God in my life as I came to you today. Three times as I was traveling, my horse stumbled and fell. And three times I was uninjured. I made it here. The father looked back into the eyes of his son and he said, praise God. I also have a remarkable mercy, a providence of God that I've taken notice of. And that is that on the way here, my horse didn't slip once. It's equally remarkable when he didn't slip at all. As equally and even more so than the son who slipped three times and recognized God's mercy to him in that. Do you see what we take for granted? Do you recognize how many kindnesses of God are given to you every day? So many that it takes real thought to perceive them. You guys may recognize something. It's hunting season. It's mating season. Deers are scratching trees, trying to kill your trees that you've planted out in your yard. You've probably seen deer dead on the side of the road in the last month, unlike the rest of the time. How many of you guys saw that big deer right down the street? Any of you? Yeah. They're all over. Dead on the side of the road. There's a few of you that have hit deer recently. And I'm sorry about that. But if you hit a deer and your bumper was mangled, your body was fine, you would feel grateful that you hadn't broken any arms or limbs or maybe that your airbags didn't implode and it's going to be an easier fix on your vehicle. But should you not be equally thankful when you drive past Secor Metro Park or drive through another area with thick trees to each side of the road and a deer never jumps out and hits your car? Is it not the better scenario of the two? And yet we are thankful for an accident that could have been worse, but we are often not thankful or never thankful for those accidents or things that don't happen to us, the general mercy and kindness of God that we live in every day. If you were to lose your job and fall into financial hardship, and then after that your boss call you on the phone and say, I'm giving you your job back, and actually your supervisor left, and we want you to take that position, you would be very thankful, very grateful. Are you not thankful or grateful for that job that you have every day that provides for your family? Or do you complain about it on your way to work? or after work to your wife. Thank God for his unknown benefits. Thank him for blessings and mercies that are not obvious on the surface of life. Thank him for his unseen favor and love. Give thanks to God always and for all things. Now, after seeking to lay out the plain point that God desires us to give thanks to him always and for all things, I want to speak about why we must do so. And there are three things that I'd like to point out. First is that God is worthy of it. Why do we thank God always and for all things? He is worthy of your thanks. And when I say that he's worthy of thanksgiving, I'm not saying that he deserves it just because of the things that he's done for you. That is part of the reason that you should praise him, obviously. But even more foundational to praising God is the reason that he is God. He is God. Our thanksgiving and praise to him is not predicated on the good things that he does. Or else, if it is, when he stops doing things that we perceive as good, our praise vanishes. Our thanks is no longer on our lips. No, we praise him always and for all things because foundationally, he is God. He is who he is. God is supremely good. He is holy. He is perfect. He is excellent. He is good, and everything he does is good. He is generous, kind, loving, just, wrathful, punishing sin and sinners, the wicked, all-knowing, all-providing, all-sustaining. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, shortly before he was betrayed by Judas, the crowds met him as he walked in. It's called the triumphal entry. And they crowded the streets, and they cut down palm branches, and they stripped themselves of their robes, and they threw the palm branch, their robes down 
before Jesus as he rode on that donkey and they waved the palm branches in the air in celebration and they cried aloud, Blessed be the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And this made the religious leaders, the Pharisees, very upset. They came to Jesus and they said, Will you not tell your disciples to shut up? Will you not tell them to be quiet, to refrain from glorifying you in this way? And what they were saying is, is you aren't God. They can't speak to you. Like, they can't worship you like this. And what did Jesus say back to them? He said, I tell you, if they become silent, even the stones will cry out. Even the stones. We give thanks to God because he is who he is. I am who I am. Great is the Lord, highly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. This is foundational to why we as Christians can and should give thanks to God always and for all things. If you've been to my house in the last couple of years, one of the things you may have taken notice of is the fact that we don't have much of a backyard or side yard. Um, a great lament of my wife has been that <laughs> we don't have a space around the house. <laughs> Actually, there's a backstory to that. We had a ground around the house, and then I decided I wanted to raise the elevation. For, so for the past two years, we've had mud surrounding our house and big piles of dirt piled everywhere. And it's taken a little while to get it all spread out and dealt with. But we're getting there. And now the ground has been leveled. The elevation's been raised. We've leveled it. We've raked it. And... We've planted grass. We planted grass in November. Now, not a great time to plant grass, but God has been very kind to us, and grass is coming, it's amazing. Seed germination. What is required when you plant grass seed? Well, it requires many things. It requires optimal temperature. It requires moisture. It requires oxygen. It needs specific light conditions. And we often think about ourselves with regard to Thanksgiving like grass seed with regard to germination. It needs the right conditions. It needs the right temperature, the right environment. It needs the blessing of rain to fall on it. But this is not true. It may be how we feel. It may be how we act. But this is not true. Unlike grass seed, we do not need the perfect conditions to generate praise to God. God is, and that fact alone is all the reason we need to thank him always. But again, that's not sufficient in and of itself because we are not just to thank him always, we are to thank him for all things. It's a dual command. This leads me to the second reason why we must praise God. We must praise God because he is working for your good. In good times of life, it's easy to see. In difficult times, when times are bitter, when God's blessings come to us in a manner that are disguised, when his messages of love and affection for us come in envelopes that are black and look scary, we are to give thanks. We are to give thanks for dark things, for cutting things, for things that plague us and pain us, things that disquiet our hearts, for hospital stays and bad diagnoses, for downtrends in the stock market, for loss. These are all the things, all things, which God says we ought to praise and thank him for. I'm reminded of a man who I love dearly. Years ago, after teaching at Southview, shop, auto body shop for his whole career, decided to buy a farm and to move up and start farming up in Michigan. And he bought a farm that had everything he needed, barns for the pigs. And at that farm, it had a, a big bonus, which was a barn where he could keep his two Corvettes that he had bought when he was a younger man. And he bought this property and he moved all his stuff from teaching shop up to the property, the new barn. He had all his snap-on tools up there. He had his two Corvettes parked in the barn. And he was in the midst of moving houses. And uh, the barn one day caught fire and burned to the ground. 
And then in the wake of all that tragedy happening, losing those cars, losing his lifetime of tools, uh, insurance wouldn't cover it. And that was a tragedy. And I wasn't there, but I remember being a younger man, a child, my dad being up there with him and him remarking to me many, many times about how as he stood next to this man, the man said, well, praise God, if, if, if that, those beautiful cars that she loved would have kept my son from loving the Lord, if they would have been an idol to him, if they would have caused my son to stray from the path of righteousness, I'm glad he took them, praise the Lord, as the fire was still burning on the barn. And it's a powerful story. It's a powerful testimony. It's a powerful life and heart that can say in the wake of tragedy, thanks be to God, because you see, even in great loss, God doing something. You may not recognize it, but God sees all things and say, ah, this is not good, and remove it. Why are we to praise God for the hardships? Why are we to be like that man? Well, because through these things, we are pruned. And if you know anything about horticulture, or caring for trees, or about hooves of animals, if you do not prune, things get diseased, things get sick. Things start turning bad. These things we learn, through these things we learn to depend upon God. Through God prying our earthly goods from our fingertips, we learn to place less value upon them and to place more value on the things that are eternal. Through God causing us to experience loss and death, we wrestle with the reality of our own mortality. And we must do business with the God of eternity. These are the things that are contained in the all things which we are to give thanks to God for. If we exercise the far-seeing eye of faith and not the dim eye of worldly sense and worldly sight, we will discover that nothing can be more fatal to our lives than a life without any affliction, uh, without any pruning. We will recognize that nothing is more beneficial for us than for us to be tried, pruned, tried with fire so that our dross our impurity, our worldliness might be removed. God is always working for your good. The third and final reason I offer to you to give thanks to God always and for all things is that giving thanks is the prelude to a holy life. Thanksgiving is the pathway of a life pleasing to God. It isn't for no reason that in our, or directly after our passage, which we did not read, Paul will go on to give thanks, uh, to talk about, rather, all of our human relationships. How we are to live in the context of those human relationships with one another. Gratitude toward God is the foundation of obedience to God. Gratitude toward God is the foundation of loving other people and treating them the way that God commands us to. Thanksgiving is the prelude to a holy life. Obedience to our passage. Giving thanks to God always and for all things, will keep you from sin. It will. There are some places that we must not enter because we, it would be blasphemous to thank God in that place. There are some things you must not do because it is impossible for you to thank God for it. Suppose you've made money in a dishonest way. How could you give thanks to God when you've obtained it through cheating? If you're a Christian, you are to live lives giving thanks. You must always give thanks. You must be in places watching things, experiencing things that you can give thanks to God for. And if you can't, you must leave those things behind. Thanksgiving is the prelude to a holy life. Being thankful in good times keeps you humble. It keeps us from getting comfortable. In hard times, thankfulness keeps us from the things that always are trying to tear us apart. Fear, anger, worry, grumbling, and all the other avenues of faithlessness and despair. Thanksgiving is the prelude to a holy life. The more thankful we are, the more useful we become to God. Nothing has a greater effect upon the minds of worldly men than a continual thankfulness. Christians toward God. The world is an unhappy place. 
And when you refuse to join in their unhappy songs, complaining about bosses and politics and your station in life and where you wish you could have been and comparing yourself to where your dad was or that uncle you have or your physical condition. And instead of complaining in those unhappy songs, instead giving thanks to God always for all things, it is a powerful witness to the glory and the goodness of God. When you're not thankful, when you're thankful rather, you're happy. That's just the plain truth of the matter. Unhappy people are not thankful for anything. The happiest people are those that are thankful, giving thanks to God, like our passage commands us to do. Thankful Christians are happy Christians, and happy Christians are those who are most useful to the kingdom of God. Crusty temperaments, unhappy faces are not evangelists. They might be messengers of Satan, but they will never be carriers of the gospel. Never. The gospel is good news, carried by happy hearts who are laboring to make others happy. Laboring to make others happy in the Lord is one of the greatest things that a Christian should aspire to do. But the man or woman who isn't thankful will never find himself in a position where he's desiring to give joy to others. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't work. You don't give any joy to your kids when you're unhappy. And why would that principle be true anywhere else in life? So be thankful. Thanksgiving is a prelude to a happy life. And so I just want to end by saying, be a thankful people. Be men and women who are thankful always and for all things. Not only when life is good, not only when the oil and wine abound, but when the trial and hardship is there. Somebody recently in this church in incurred a great loss, death of someone they love. And they made a comment to me that stands out. In wrestling with the agony of death and loss, the comment was, when they were comforted, they responded by saying, God is saving us. And that is someone who understands how to give thanks in all times and for all things. And Jesus, uh, would you pray with me?